I have to say it, it's wonderful and also a little surreal <laughs> to be back here after having been here for 11 years and now coming back to speak to you. And I would like to thank Colonel Athens and Captain Rubel and Captain Trainer for inviting me back to speak. And it's a pleasure to see a room full of midshipmen again because I missed you guys. I know you're different than the ones I taught, but it still looks familiar. As you did hear, uh, since I am no stranger to this school, I taught in the very course that uh, many of you are taking, or all of you are taking right now, the NE203. I was a lecturer in that course. And then I also taught an elective course that was called The Code of the Warrior, the same title as the, the book that was referenced. And it, it was pretty popular with the uh, firsties at the time, especially those headed to either BUDS or TBS. And uh, I have to say, it was a pretty unusual class. We explored the values of warrior cultures throughout history and from very different parts of the globe, everything from ancient Greeks and Romans, Vikings and Celts, Native Americans, Zulus, Chinese warrior monks, and Japanese samurai. We also tried to understand the motivation of more modern warriors, and we even peered inside the minds of terrorists. The MIDS had to do group projects for my class, and I challenged them to immerse themselves and the rest of the class in the particular culture that they had chosen. Now, you may not realize this, but midshipmen are a teeny little bit competitive. <laughs> so when I told my midshipmen to get creative, to step out of the box, to do something I hadn't seen before, something that would be memorable, they took me up on it. They dove in with a go big or go home mentality. In fact, I can only tell you now about some of the things they did because I don't work here anymore. <laughs> and they're all safely off in the fleet. I remember the mids who came to class dressed as Zulu warriors with handmade spears and leopard print loincloths. There are photos, people. I'm not making this up. I remember the mids doing a project on Native Americans who jumped into the Santee Basin in their uniforms. I remember the mid who reenacted a samurai seppuku, or ritual suicide, with a real blade, which he used to slice open a hidden packet of spaghetti taped to his abdomen. It was very cool. And of course, I didn't know up until that moment where that was going, and I just thought, I'll just go with it. <laughs> and luckily, there was spaghetti there. And perhaps my personal favorite, we had a group studying Chechen rebels who took the class hostage. They uh, zip-tied us all, including me. They gave their presentation in ski masks. And as a final flourish, and again, I kid you not, they exited the room by going out the windows and repelling down Loose Hall. Yeah, uh, they got an A. <laughs> so. But for all the fun that we had, and we did have a lot of fun, there was a very serious point to my Code of the Warrior class. Especially after 9-11, I knew that the majority of my students were about to graduate and step almost immediately into combat leadership roles, as we've just heard from that example of the, the email facing multiple deployments in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. They'd all taken any 203, so I knew they had a foundation in professional military ethics. But they all still came to me with very real concerns about questions that they had still lingering that needed answers. They knew these were questions that they were going to get asked soon as officers by their own subordinates, and they wanted to have some answers. Questions like, why should we observe rules of engagement if our enemies do not, when our enemies actually use our own rules against us? Or why should I put my troops at greater risk to protect civilians who probably support the people trying to kill us? I found it helpful to enrich my class by bringing in guest speakers who had genuine combat experience. My hope was that these combat veterans who had truly been there and done that would back up the moral lessons that I was attempting to convey. 
But I have to admit, I harbored a fear that intentionally or not, one of my guests would say something that would actually undermine my teaching. I decided, of course, that it was worth the risk, but it was always there in the back of my mind. Still, my overriding concern was that without the inclusion of these real warriors, my Code of the Warrior class would lack the credibility that it needed. So one semester, a Navy SEAL friend and colleague of mine helped secure a truly incredible guest speaker for my course, one of the few living U.S. Medal of Honor recipients, Sergeant Sammy Davis. Sergeant Davis is a compelling and engaging speaker, and he held my class in the palm of his hand. It was a thrilling day, both for my midshipmen and me. But then we had a Q&A unscripted session at the end, and there came a moment of truth. There was a student in my class, we'll call him Tom, not his real name, <laughs> who was very bright, but also rather cocky and somewhat cynical. Tom enjoyed challenging authority, particularly mine. Tom's hand shot up the moment Sergeant Davis opened the floor to questions. When he was called on, Tom asked something more or less like this, in about this tone. All semester, our professor has been talking to us about the importance of preserving our humanity in war. But you've lived the realities of combat. Isn't it true that, as an officer, I should not waste time worrying about the humanity of my troops? My only job is to keep them alive. I held my breath. Sergeant Davis now had the power to completely undo everything I had tried to accomplish as an ethics instructor all semester, not to mention potentially shatter my faith in the material that I had been teaching and writing about for so long. But I need not have worried. Sergeant Davis's response did more to encourage my midshipmen to take military ethics seriously than anything I had or ever could have done in the classroom before or since. Sergeant Davis went right up to Tom, a few feet from him, and shouted at him as only a sergeant can. And this is a more or less direct quote. If that's what you believe, you do not deserve to be an officer, and you need to get the hell out of my military right now. That was just the opening blast. He went on with sustained passion to instruct Tom and all the other midshipmen present that as officers, they must do everything in their power to safeguard the humanity and not just the lives of their troops. War is an assault on the humanity of every individual caught up in its destructive path. And that assault has to be resisted every bit as much as a physical assault. The men and women you lead into combat are your responsibility, he said, and ensuring that you le your leading of them does not strip them of their humanity is critical to discharging your fundamental duties as an officer. Most importantly, Sergeant Davis said, if you think death is the worst thing that can happen, you're wrong. There are a lot of things worse than death. Anyone who's seen war knows that. By the end of Sergeant Davis's tirade, Tom was chastened to a degree I had not thought possible. I have to admit I did enjoy that a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but he was not alone in having been shaken up by sar the sergeant's words. All of his classmates were sobered by this burden that he had placed on them in such a dramatic fashion. This was a man they, ex they respected and admired. But I had to ask, was it a fair burden? How are we to understand Sergeant Davis's stern charge to my students? What does it mean for an officer to be responsible for safeguarding the humanity of his or her troops? I was struck by the extraordinary implication behind those words. <clears throat> Can a case be made to hold leaders responsible not only for the external behavior of their subordinates, but also the internal, the character-based consequences of their service? What are the obligations of ethical leadership? And what challenges must leaders confront in the context of modern combat? It's far too simplistic 
to say that good leaders must ensure that neither they nor they, those they lead violate the laws of armed conflict. Why is this inadequate? Well, first of all, ethics demands more than mere legal compliance. Doing the right thing may, and often does, require you to go far beyond the minimum legal standards. There's a very funny scene in the uh, comedy film Stripes in which Bill Murray's character is asked by an army recruiter, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And Murray answers, convicted? No, never convicted. <laughs> the just conduct of war is not the right realm for a you rate what you skate mentality. Not only may the law not go far enough, but a leader who places emphasis merely on meeting the letter of the law may intentionally or not actually signal his or her followers that the only really important thing is not getting caught. Convicted? No, never convicted. Next, rules and laws are written to try to anticipate situations in which troops will find themselves, but they can never anticipate everything. If you only say, follow all the applicable rules and laws, you will leave your troops with no guidance in some of the most difficult, gut-wrenching situations. The rules of war state that if a terrified eight-year-old girl who just saw her parents cut in half in crossfire between insurgents and U.S. Marines on an urban street, picks up an AK and points it at you, you can shoot her dead. But should you? Will the fact that you have legal cover help you sleep at night after you kill a scared child at close range? Or will you forever wonder if there might have been some other way you could have responded to the genuine threat that she posed? Warriors must not feel that they are entering an entirely separate moral universe when they step into the combat zone, and they will never be held accountable for what they do there. I'm reminded of a quote by uh, J. Glenn Gray, a World War II veteran and author of The Warriors, Reflections on Men in Battle. He wrote, we all figured we might be dead in the next minute, so what difference did it make what we did? But the longer I was over there, the more I became convinced that it was the other way around that counted that because we might not be around much longer, we had to take extra care how we behaved. The idea was simply that we had to answer for what we did. We had to answer to something, to someone, maybe just to ourselves. The warrior's conscience, the voice of his or her humanity, is precious. The experience of war or combat can harden people and desensitize them to death, destruction, and loss. Killing fellow human beings causes a kind of moral damage. But that damage need not be excessive or permanent, so long as our warriors retain the capacity to step out of that killing mode, recognize and show respect for their enemy's humanity, and feel the full moral weight of their actions. And all of that requires much more than unreflective rule following. So if we agree that ethical leadership requires more than the recital of rules and laws, what more is needed? Ethical leaders must also foster a healthy command climate within their units. To quote from a, a brief but compelling uh, 2008 article on command climate, from Army Magazine, forgive the Army reference, uh, by Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Doty and Major Joe Gellino. Command climate is the culture of a unit. It is the way a unit conducts business. The leader of the organization is solely responsible for the organization's command climate. Commanders at all levels establish this climate.